Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Dr. K's Psychobabble. I am actually going to be talking about group therapy, its history and practice in response to one of my viewers, a person by the name of Hadi Mimdow. I don't know you, but requested that I do a video on group therapy and its history. And I thought that that was a great question. So here you go. This is for you and everybody else, of course, we share. But we're going to be talking about group therapy. Now, many of us understand therapy. If you've ever been in therapy, you meet with a counselor, discuss things, there are different models of how we approach therapy. But then group therapy came along and provided a whole interesting dynamic related to that. So I'm going to talk about that today. Now, before we go anywhere close to group therapy, we have to look at that first word, group. And what do we mean by a group? And this is where I reach into my sociology bag and I pull out how we understand groups and how groups operate in order to recognize how they're advantageous when we apply them to the process of therapy. So let's talk about what groups are and then apply it to, to therapy after. Now, first and foremost, groups here represented by this circle is essentially, according to the world of sociology, two or more people. Those two or more people interact frequently. And we understand, of course, in today's world, groups can be face to face, but they can also be online. So the so we have two or more people interacting frequently. There's a sense of belonging to that group. And this is, this is an important quality. Each one of these qualities is going to become important as we look at the applications of groups to the process of therapy. So a sense of belonging, like I am a member of this group, and that certainly has to be established for the group process to be able to work and a sense of interdependence. And what both the belonging and the inter interdependence part kind of go along with the lines of identity. So let me, let me just throw a little editorial in there. Identity, of course, is that constructed part of our lives that we say is me, that all the components of me, my self-perceptions, the perceptions of others that I incorporate into myself, all of these things. And when we belong to a group, it is one of the things, in fact, it's one of the things that we sometimes put at the top of the list as a sense of our identity. Certainly, if we look at our name, the way that in America, in, in, in Western thought, we have the it's sort of a cultural representation. It's the individual and the group that they belong to. So Mark, individual, in the group, Kavanaugh, family, being one of the manifestations of groups. So it's so important that it actually formulates the written identity of who I am. And being a member of the Kavanaugh family is, of course, an important part of my sense of who I am. So when we look at, let's say, the purposeful entry into a group, this is for group therapy, one of the goals is that it's going to become an important part of who you are. And we'll see how that sort of manifests in that term family. It could be another family structure. Now, we, need to, we still need to a little bit more, learn a little bit more about how groups kind of are defined. So here we have groups that, you know, the, the actual membership here, two or more people interact frequently, sense of belonging, sense of interdependence and identity. Groups also have a life of their own, and that's sort of where we see the sociological part of this. Every group has a sense of norms. Now, norms are the behaviors and structures that are in the particular group. It's the behavior that you engage in, what you, you know, what you will see happening in the group. And I'm going to contrast this with one of the other characteristics here, make some clarity. 
Groups have values, meaning a hierarchical list of what's important. And we'll see how this applies. And finally, not finally, but expectations. I want to contrast it with norms. Expectations is the behavior we have of others, procedures, how things are going to operate, those kind of norms are sort of the, they're closely related to expectations, but they're internal to me. They're norms in terms of the, uh, the factors as why the group is getting together, you know, and the, um, uh, the aspects of the group that are considered uh, to be regulated and whatnot. Now that term regulated in the group arises from another characteristic of groups that we call social control. Now, social control is important because groups, because they have norms, values, expectations for individuals' behavior in order to be a member of that group, the social control component is the aspect of the group that says, that, that it, basically the enforcer. In sociology, we look at social control as everything from the leadership or parental figures within a family to the criminal justice system for our society as a, a mechanism that says, wait a minute, you are acting outside of the norms, values, and expectations of the group or society you need to come back in. And that control mechanism not only identifies abnormal behavior in relation to normal behavior, acting outside of that, it, it is a mechanism by which the group enforces those norms and expectations and brings people back in and say, if you want to be a member of this group, you have to comply with the norms, values, expectations that we collectively have defined. Now, all of these things are going to remain important, so bear with me here. And all of those things essentially add up to culture. Now, when I say culture, you often think maybe of you know, food festivals, you know, those, those kinds of things, countries, languages, you know, stuff like that. And certainly those are part of the norms, values, expectations and whatnot of a given culture. But every group has a culture. Every time we have two or more people that interact frequently, have a sense of belonging and interdependence, a culture develops within that group. So let's look at sort of an innocuous example of that. Let's say here's a group that you might belong to your local snowmobile club. Okay, so we can look at that group and go through all of these definitions and have a sense as to how this group operates. So the group is two or more people. You can't have a snowmobile club of just one, but you can have a snowmobile club of two and you can have a snowmobile club of 500. So two or more people interacting frequently, either the meetings of the group interacting, emailing each other, or heck, going snowmobiling together. That's the whole point. You know, it's, it's like-minded individuals that share that sense of belonging. I have a snowmobile, you have a snowmobile, we like to ride our snowmobiles, let's have a schedule of times we can do that together so like-minded snowmobile lovers can unite and go on trips together. And there's a sense of interdependence, like maybe within this group and the different roles that people have, some people are in charge of, let's say, marking the trails, other people are in charge of getting uh, a schedule of rides out there on the web, some people are into, um, calling people up and inviting them to the rides. And maybe there's some people in there that are very knowledgeable about riding the snowmobile. They'll teach people how to ride. Other people have a me are mechanics and they'll help you solve the minor problems associated with your snowmobile. There we go. We have this interdependence based on this shared joy and liking of snowmobiling. So we can also see the other aspects of the group manifesting itself in the snowmobile club, we have norms, you know, people will ride and they'll show up for meetings. 
They have values. They all like snowmobiling. And maybe, maybe, and this is interesting because I used to use as an example in my class the organization here in Maine, the United Bikers of Maine. And these were motorcycle riders, very similar to our snowmobile club here. It's an it's a entire organization that covers the state of Maine. And it was not that long ago that I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a change in some of the norms and values associated with the United Bikers of Maine. And what this came from, this is where we see value systems, is there were a good number of individuals within the United Bikers of Maine that held a value that a certain brand of motorcycle was superior to all others. And if you didn't have that brand and you were riding another brand, you were somehow less than. Now, of course, the brand was Harley Davidson. So if you didn't have a Harley, you weren't really a biker. They formally, my understanding is that organization formally created a policy <clears throat> saying, nope, we are in favor of riding regardless of the type of bike. And they really tried to suppress that kind of activity where there'd be kind of one member looking down on another in order to, you know, based on, on their type of bike that they have, which would actually get in the way of one of the other aspects of the group, and that is a sense of belonging. Imagine you, you join the United Bikers of Maine simply because you like riding, and you happen to have, what's the really, the Ducati. You have one of those. You have one of those racing bikes. And then somebody says, hey, you don't really belong. That wasn't the goal of the United Bikers of Maine. So they had to make that value system into a policy in order to unite all their members, regardless of the kind of bike that they were riding. So maybe in our snowmobile club here, we have a bunch of Polaris, we have Arctic Cat, we have Skidoo, we have all of Yamaha, it's all there. And maybe the value systems in this group is we don't pick on people because of the kind of machine that they have. We just enjoy riding. Expectations. Again, this is procedural. What's going to happen? The meetings happen on time. The person has the agenda. When people show up for the rides, everybody's ready. You're supposed to be well-dressed. All of these things in terms of the expectations of how the group operates. And what if... What if you're out on a ride and you're riding around and you're Arctic Cat and you turn to the person who has a Yamaha and you say, that is not a good machine. You don't belong. This is, you know, if you don't have an Arctic Cat, you're not really a good snowmobile rider. And maybe some of the leadership or maybe even just some of the regular, you know, we all have a responsibility as a part of the part of uh, each group that we belong to to reinforce the values. And we might say, hey, stop that. That might be the first thing, might say the first way in which a group puts forth a uh, social control. You need to stop that. You know what our rules are. We don't have this stuff. And the person's like, I don't care. And they just keep on doing it. Eventually, if it gets out of hand, the leadership of that group could get together and actually remove the individual from the group. That would be ultimately the consequence of that person's behavior. So back to our example here, talking about the snowmobile group, of course we see that the snowmobile group has a culture. Now just think, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a leap right now, two or more people interacting frequently, a sense of belonging, interdependence, norms, values, expectations, and social control comprising the culture of this group and simply apply that to group therapy. Group therapy will be two or more people. They interact frequently, sense of belonging, interdependence, norms, values, and expectations for their behavior. That's a critical aspect of the process of group therapy. And of course, social control, the leadership and membership providing a safe place for individuals to share and process. And that creates the culture that we know of as group therapy. And essentially, group therapy is the application of the dynamics of a group and how they manage each other's behavior. So we're going to get a little bit into that 
when I describe the actual processes that occur within group therapy. But first, we need to take a little journey down the history timeline and take a look at where did group therapy come from. Now, the first time we saw group therapy sort of appear on the scene in that there was three individuals involved, Trigent Burrow, Paul Schidler, Childer, uh, sorry about that, and Joseph Pratt. They, each of them, were psychoanalysts. Now we're talking about Freud now, right? Freudian psychoanalysis. Now psychoanalysis is a process of applying the skill sets that Freud set forth in order to explore the unconscious. Now we often portray the individual therapy, not group therapy, but individual therapy as, you know, the individuals laying on the couch and there's Freud sitting back, taking notes, providing wisdom and interpretation and whatnot. That picture actually portrays the process of what, what Freud called free association, which just just yak away, talk. And I'm going to see your unconscious, you know, as the therapist, I'm going to see your unconscious motivations bubble to the top. You'll have slips of the tongue. You'll, you'll make mistakes. And, and the therapist kind of looks for those as interpretive examples of underlying feelings that you may not be aware of because they rest, reside in your unconscious. Now, when we see that in a group perspective, all the members, there might be a leader, there may be a therapist, there may not be, but all the members of the group may be involved in providing feedback to individuals about how they're dealing with these unconscious sort of thing. People might engage in free association with each other. They may, they might be facilitated. There may be dream interpretation. That's another way in which um, psychodynamic groups uh, get involved. They, they interpret each other's dreams. And then you add to that all of the dynamics of groups. You know, there's a sense of belonging. There's the norms, values, and expectations. Like keep things in line. You know, there's a you know, a sense of uh, belonging in that group and identity and whatnot, helping move forward the goals of psychoanalytic therapy. Now, this occurred in the first half of the 20th century, so the early 1900s, you know, leading up until 1950 or so, the wide span, like the first half, uh, was where, is where these individuals were active and publishing about this, and it was simply the application of psychoanalysis within a, within a group setting and taking advantage of those group dynamics. Now, later on, arising during the 1940s, overlapping, of course, with these others, we see T groups as a kind of, an, uh, kind of a... Um, generic term, and it actually refers to transactional groups, which is a, there was a transaction. They were looking to get people together to talk. Now, the important thing to understand about T groups is T groups were not necessarily confined to solving psychological problems. Like they're, they weren't really always therapeutic per se, as we perceive therapy. They were generic in ways of getting people together in order to get them to interact with one another as a way of problem solving. Now, of course, now, notwithstanding, the individuals that put this together were two of the most famous psychologists of the time, Kurt Lewin, and of course, Carl Rogers, famous for his, his uh, person-centered therapy and the, um, the value of the individual. And it projected this into this sense of groups getting together, valuing, you know, one of the value systems that everybody can contribute, everybody has a voice, everybody's the same, we're leaving behind roles and expectations and whatnot in that group, and we're all the same when we're doing this. So when this was applied to, let's say, a business structure, and we see this even today, you might get a team building sort of group getting together at the at the at your workplace and when you're on that team building group it's not the boss it's not the employee it's not the we're all the same and we see that 
application of person-centered therapy from Rogers coming into what we now really probably internally con conceptualize when we get together as groups. We're all on the same level when we're in that group. And actually one of the ways in which we can really, really benefit from the group process is by creating some of those expectations. So Lewin and Rogers were engaging in these groups and they were engaging in sensitivity training. And, we, and this, is, this is from this point to the modern day. So we have sensitivity training in terms of understanding the diversity of thought, diversity of people within their organization. And I've actually engaged in some sensitivity training at the workplace in order to assist an individual with disabilities being able to be ingrained into the culture of that of that uh, that work culture sensitivity training meaning the group gets together including the individual who let's say is different than them and we can look at difference in all the ways and we develop a sensitivity in that group to that individual's difference we focus on that difference and by doing so we show how they're not different. So if it's race, or if it's religion, or if it's sexual orientation, or if it's gender, whatever, the group can encounter that, talk about it with the individual there in order to become more sensitive to that person's worldview. And we see how a skilled therapist, certainly like Carl Rogers, can bring people together and talk about those things in order to unify the group. And I was engaged in that when I was working with individuals who had various disabilities from, from mental illness to um, physical and mobility issues, sensory disabilities and all that. And oftentimes in the workplace, there was a certain mystery or or I don't really understand this. I'm a little nervous about talking to this person. You know, this, we had one individual who was a quadriplegic going into a workplace as an engineer and nobody would talk to him. They're, you know, what do you say? He speaks through a machine and, and, and I don't really, I'm fearful of that. Sensitive, sensitivity training happened and that individual, that individual's humanity was brought right to the forefront. You know, let's, let's look past the disability at the person and the, it very, very, uh, not certainly because of my effort or anything, but the, the fellow engineers embraced him and it was actually a very, very positive experience for everybody. Um, have to say the individual was also brilliant and solved some major issues that were going on. So he became part of that inner group rather quickly. So moving on to more of the history of sensitivity training, we have human relations, encounter groups, these all growing, I mean, think from the 40s on in the encounter groups in the 60s and 70s and 80s and different kinds of groups getting together. I mean, groups were the thing and they started to manifest in different ways. And this brings us really into the modern day. There were groups that got together to accomplish a task, a work group, to, uh, to a group of individuals in the community that wanted to put a park together, a memorial. They would get together and they would use the same skills that we see in, in group dynamics in order to bring about that task. We see evaluative groups getting together, let's say, um, in, in my college, we, we're accredited and there's a group of people representing those values and expectations for uh, performance that come in and work with a group at my institution to assess and evaluate how well we're doing. And when you do that as a group, there's sort of a shared responsibility that kind of gets, you know, different people, different skills. And you see those same dynamics. You see, it feels like we're getting away from therapy, but it really is the ways in which we start using groups in order to process just about anything. Topical groups, getting together to discuss and learn about different topics. Support groups, now we're getting close, right? Getting close. So individuals with a shared uh, trauma or a shared situation. It was the support groups 
are the rage right now to, for individuals to be able to find others who have shared grief, shared disabilities, shared concerns, shared uh, parts of their identity, you know, and they get together with others like them in order to receive the social support that you get from that sense of belonging, interdependence, interacting frequently with people that share that particular aspect. We have advocacy groups that get together. And finally, the big one, self-help. Now, through the 40s and 50s, Alcoholics Anonymous became on the forefront of dealing with, of course, a very huge problem, alcohol dependence. And Alcoholics Anonymous is based on the premise of groups of individuals getting together, a very informal and often rotating sense of leadership. So individuals all have an opportunity to be leaders and followers in those groups. There are very specific rules about confidentiality, about triggering, about all kinds of aspects of how that group is supposed to interact. And when people get together, they're all under that expectation of, their, of, of those uh, norms, values, and expectations for that group, the culture. It's enforced by the membership, and those individuals benefit from being with each other, having this shared experience of, let's say, substance abuse or sex addiction or any other one of the ways in which we seek self-help and weight loss to exercise groups, you know, and stuff like that, all the ways in which people interact in order to benefit from those particular uh, aspects of groups. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens in groups, and I'm gonna really focus on group therapy this time and how it's different than individual therapy. Now, individual therapy is, of course, it's a dyad. Technically speaking, it's a group, two or more people, you know, so you can actually, from the sociological perspective, all of those dynamics are there. But in group therapy, we're looking, we're actually bringing other equitable members into that group. And again, there's some where there's a specific leader, there's a therapist that is facilitating the actual group therapy. And there are some groups that get together where there is no specific individual that's in charge. And the group culture shapes the expectations of what's happening and engages the social control mechanisms and stuff. So when a group of people come together in order to interact frequently and address a shared concern, a shared problem, there are processes that begin to happen that relate to the fact that it is in a group, the context in which these things are happening, and group dynamics. We take, we borrow from social psych in order to understand how people's behaviors are modified and changed dynamically because they happen to be in a group of people. In psychology, in social psychology, we refer to this as the, the power of the situation. It's the dynamics of being in a group that make your behavior different. And we all can very much relate to this. If, if we're at our grandparents' house, we probably engage in a different set of normal behavior than if we're out at the bar with our friends. So that's those sets of behavior you and I recognize that when I'm out with my friends, there's a certain set of norms, values, and expectations. When I'm at grandma's house, there's a whole different set of norms, values, and expectations maybe. And I can do that. I can go from one place to another. And just as a little, a little sort of, you know, maybe this will come as a shock to some people, but children just because just I'm talking about it. children that grow up in two different households and there's often concern about the structure at one and maybe the lack of structure, you know, the, you know, mom is always letting you stay up until whatever and dad's trying to enforce the, you know, the, the bedtime and all that stuff. You know what? It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It's cumbersome when the kids come to, in, you know, they come to one parent's house and the loose structure of the other one is assumed to come to yours, get into these arguments and all that stuff. But there's no damage. 
that comes from that because we all learn that different environments, different groups that we belong to mean different expectations. That's fine. That's not a big deal to talk about. Not a big issue. Within limits, of course, you know, if the one family's letting them drink alcohol at 14, of course, that's a little different, but the, de the different dynamics, that's fine. They can, de kids can deal with that. Just stop fighting. That's what they can't deal with. So it's just a little bit of advice. If anybody's out there watching this and they're thinking about this in terms of their kids being in two different groups, one is his group, one is her group. Don't worry about that stuff. Worry about keeping peace between mom and dad because the kids didn't get divorced. You didn't. End of, end of, end of soapbox. Let's get back into what happens in groups that therapists sometimes take advantage of people being in group for, for group therapy. So looking at the group context, here are some things that start to happen. First, there's a sense of what is universal, what is shared, I'm not alone, but also differences, nuances that are different between my experiences and that individual's. This can only happen within that group context. Secondly, information. Great avenue for sending information out. You can send, you can speak once and 12 people hear it. Everybody, you know, if you're teaching something, you want to get a message out as a therapist to your group, it's really cool to bring them all together. And then you just have to send that message once. And you can actually, you know, people can ask questions or just like a classroom. We get together in groups for classes because sometimes individuals within that group are going to be forthcoming with their questions, questions that other people might have but are too shy to ask. And we get to take advantage of that context as well. Providing hope. This is really interesting because sometimes groups, uh, self-help groups particularly, will have a diversity. One of the one of the, the diversity concepts within that group is some people are further along the line of recovery. So when you enter into that group, let's say the support group, you see people who have been through something similar to you and you see that they've made it that they got better a little bit. They're still struggling, that's okay, but they're, you know, it's not the end of the world and they actually have, have done some progress and those people become a source of hope for ourselves in our own journey. And we see socialization. Now socialization here, I'm gonna do two things. <clears throat> First, socialization is the chance that you're getting out of your environment, going and meeting new people and learning social skills that may have been impacted by the problem. So let's say you're an alcoholic and probably not the best way to say it. I'm to, I think as a psychologist, I'm supposed to say you're a person who has a substance use disorder. You, your life, your socialization skills have been happening with the assistance of alcohol. So maybe you're a really cool, talkative, slick kind of conversationalist when you have alcohol in you, but no alcohol and you're shy, you kind of stumble over and you're really nervous about socializing. In fact, that might be one of the principal reasons why you drink. When you belong to a group where there's no alcohol and you're forced to socialize, it's, it's actually a way in which you can practice those skills in the absence of alcohol. Just an example. There is, however, the use of the word socialization within the sociology context. And the socialization is not only a definition of the social interactions and conversations that can happen in a group, but socialization is also the word we describe for teaching the culture of the group. So we are socialized by our families as to the expectations, norms, and values of our culture. That's one of the functions of family. The function here is the ability for the group to communicate information and supportively what are the values, norms, and expectations of this group. 
so that individual can participate successfully in that. So the two uses of that word socialization in this context. We also see there's a certain existential factor of belonging to a group and not being alone. It relates to that universality and diversity, and it's a feeling-oriented shifting of the world where like, wow, maybe, maybe I thought I was alone and my worldview was I'm a victim, and then I get together with these individuals and like, Oh, this is widespread. There's other people. It's bigger problem. There's other contexts for this. Maybe there's social structural issues. You know, let's say that when we look at racism today, we see racism as an individual event that people experience, and then they get together with people of the same race and others, and they examine the issue and they share their problems, and they find out it's bigger than that. That there's this maybe systemic racism that's going on. No, no maybe about it. There's systemic racism going around and it changes your individual experience of racism as an individual attack on me as opposed to it's, a, it's an attack upon us. And, you can and that can be a very transformative experience for an individual that really only happens when they encounter this issue within the structure of a group. And finally, a development of self-understanding in relation to the group. A new you comes out as both a member of this group and your perspective on the particular issue that this group is working on. Now, therapists often engage in, and I, I hate to use the word manipulation, but it's actually a fair word where we engage the group in interacting with each other dynamically, the dynamic me has a lot of energy, using the group energy in order to get them to interact in a particular kind of way that would be beneficial for all of the members. You'll uh, sometimes you'll be in a group and someone's going to throw out you know a devil's advocate thing. You know, what if we had to close the company tomorrow? What would you do? You know, kind of like get people going, because when you do when you insert that kind of energy into a group. In different individuals, parts of their personality are going to reveal themselves and create, essentially kind of create material for you to work with dynamically in the group. So we call those group dynamics. Cohesiveness. We already talked about the individual who um, is part of a group experiencing a sense of connection to this group. We utilize that in order to motivate individuals to participate. Now, if we have a norm and an expectation within our group of sharing personal information, this is peer pressure. You want to be a part of this group and the norm is that you share information about yourself. That's really more of an expectation then if you want to continue to be a member of this group, eventually you're going to have to share. Now, many groups don't insist, you know, day one, but eventually the expectation is there and you're, wa you're looking around and any individual who's been a part of a group and they haven't shared yet experiences increased social pressure for them. Hey, the only one we haven't heard from is Mark today. What's going on with Mark? And that pressure that we're actually taking peer pressure and utilizing it to maybe address some of the barriers people have for sharing their own personal information in the group. Family recapitulation, what a loaded term this is. Now, let's just cut right to it. Again, way back into those psychodynamic days we sometimes see the dysfunction of our social interactions with others having its roots in our family of origin. Poor parenting, absent parenting, substance-related issues, poverty, disability, and all those things, and the family dynamics that are... Now, we look at family as that first sort of core group that we interacted with, the group that we belong to, have a sense of belonging to, and it might have been faulty 
There might have been, you know, things that didn't go well. Now we gen we joined this group, and may maybe we rejected that group. Maybe we're still. It's really hard to forever and completely reject. There's always a sense of connection there. But here we have this new group where we can start over. We can look at some of those issues, reactions to confrontation. How do we deal with confrontation? How do we deal with emotions? How do we deal with leadership? How do we do deal with change? And we practice those skills in this new family that is because of the norms, values, and expectations and social control is more functional. It's a more functional. So we get to repeat some of those lessons that we should have learned in our family of origin, such how to manage anger. Let's say in our family of origin, we learned how to manage anger by throwing pots and pans, and beating the crap out of people. That that's what we learned. And then we go to this group and we relearn that in a group that demands that you can't be throwing things around and you can't be beating people up. In fact, you need to learn a skill to be able to manage emotional intelligence. You need to learn that skill to be a part of this group. And you want to be a part of the group because there's a sense of connection and membership and that pressure shapes your, 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 your practice. And then you can go out and express that in the world. You become a less demonstratively angry person. It's such a great opportunity within group therapy to go back and fix some of those things that the family didn't do such a good job at. Altruism, simply helping other people. This, and, and I think one of the great dynamics of what happens inside of groups is when somebody says something, somebody's talking about their journey, and an individual sits back and they're inspired. Like, wow, I've never heard you that it's said that way. You really your experience really resonates with what I'm going through. And the cool thing is the group encourages you not to just hold that in, but to raise your hand and say, thank you for what you've done. I mean, you just told me you went through crap and you made me feel better. How, what a, what a weird. And then the individual who now learns to give parts of their self to others that others benefit from them, what a great start to a life of altruism, of looking for opportunities to help people. And the, and the immediate benefit, now altruism technically is giving without the expectation of receipt, but it's so cool in these groups where you can say things, you can share things, and the people that you've influenced can come back and say thank you. Maybe they do it privately, maybe they do it, but you know what you said today was really meaningful for me, and you're like, wow. I thought I was meaningless. I thought what I was going through when I first started this group, I didn't know anybody else had what I had. And here I am saying things that others interpret as wisdom. How cool is that? And so that's one of the very neat dynamics that comes out of being in a group. Imitative behavior, this can probably, you know, what, what again, similar to that, we can be looking at members of the group and saying, you know, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like that lady. See what they've done, the way they're thinking, provides us another model. This is that part of that diversity. Like, wow, they think about this different. Why don't I start thinking about this different and I can imitate that person's behavior and learn from the experts that are in the group. Interpersonal learning, this kind of relates to that socialization, interpersonal learning, the dynamics of dealing with other people. And finally, this great word from psychodynamics, catharsis, which is the aha moment that we often talk about in therapy where an individual goes, they had that light bulb goes off and like, I get it. Now, so maybe an individual's entered into a group to, for something they're struggling with, haven't really thought it that that it's that a big deal that it is a big deal, but they're going to go to the group anyway, and they see other people talking about how their behavior has affected others, and they just get like, "Wow, got it." I I'm hearing these stories, and inside I'm seeing how I've done the same thing, and oh yeah. Now I understand why my partner's mad at me 
for what I do and or my, my kids won't talk to me or you know something like that depending on you know certainly depending on the situation but I get it now I get it now and the light goes on and really that's where we get the dynamic motivation for change not a it's not a cognitive thing people can look at their behavior and they can understand that it's probably not the best thing but it's when we get that emotional light that comes on and we realize that at the very base level human to human we are not living up even to our own expectations and that we based on the inspiration we get from hearing other people's stories we internalize the ability that we have to bring about change in our own lives this is probably the most powerful aspect of dynamic group therapy. So, what does the APA have to say about this? Now, according to the American Psychological Association, group therapy is a primary means of providing services, and individuals have expressed an unusual amount of surprise as to how rewarding it is to share their stories with a group of people. A group of strangers, and the strangers become family as we become more and more attached to that group, and how rewarding that is for that shared identity. Groups act as a support network and sounding board for difficult decisions, personal changes that you're gonna make, going into new relationships, making a new purchase, getting a new job and by, you know, let's say we're, we're in a group that's dealing with substance abuse and we're looking at changing a relationship. This is one of the only places that are going to say, Hey, are you running away from your problems or are you just, whoo, you can only get that from really good friends, right? You know, <laughs> the, the people are going to throw it at you and challenge your ideas. Now, of course, this, if this happens too early in the process, we're not coming back. But if we develop the sense of sharing and connection with these individuals and we admire people, and let's say that person who last week said something really inspirational to us, and the next week they say, hey, you're doing some BS right now, and I'm calling you out on it, and that, it hurts but it's the wake-up call that allows us to benefit from those social interactions with people who have maybe traveled along the path a little bit further than we have. Regular sharing and listening with others places your problems in context, both in terms of its severity and in terms of its shared quality. And then finally, different people look at and experience things differently, and this provides us with options as to how we are going to deal with our personal situations and whatnot. And so this is, this is what the APA lists as the benefits of engaging in group psychotherapy. So today we sort of went back, talked about groups, all groups that we belong to and all groups have these qualities. I mean, functional families are have a lot of therapeutic qualities to them. That's why, you know, we families are still the best way to raise kids. We have some history about where this started happening, looking at just regular therapy and, and applying them to, into groups. And then as we become better at understanding, as we became better at understanding how groups interact in that con how people interact in group contexts and the group dynamics and how they can be very, very powerful forces for change, we can see the benefits of engaging in group therapy. So Hattie, I hope this has been a good video for you. This was this is for you and for all. This is a fun topic to explore. I really enjoyed doing the research on this to get some of the history of this and to share with you this exciting dynamics that happen as a result of people getting together. And um, so I will see you next time and, and uh, be sure to subscribe, be sure to get the bell thing going. So you, and please comment. I like to, I'm, I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm going more into the comments section and um, responding to people. So please comment on these. It's always nice to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. And please suggest topics like Hattie did and uh, I'll get right on them. That's, well, if there's thousands, then, you know, it'd be a while, but um, I'll do my best. So have a great, have a great day.